and welcome everyone to our talk, Learning to Judge or Judgments as a Ranking Gold Standard. Um, as Nate already said, we are Arne and Andrea from the search team at Otto. Um, Arne is our business designer and I'm a data scientist in the team. Since um, Otto might not be a known name for you, aside from being shown as a sponsor in this, uh, in this presentation room, um, some words about our company. Um, Otto is a large online shop in Germany with around 2.5 million visits per day and up to 10 orders per second. Um, our company is a full range trader and currently we are expanding our business model to becoming a platform and selling not only auto products, but also products from other sellers on our webpage. Um, about our product search, um, some numbers from 2020, we have around 1.5 million search queries per day. And on peak days, we get up to almost 5 million search queries. Um, in 2020, those search queries were uh, divided in around 40 million unique search terms. Um, now that you know a bit about Otto, we start with the topic of our talk. Um, so in the last weeks and months, we were learning to judge in our team. And why did we use the judgments? We want to use them for a learning to rank model. So uh, we will start the talk with learning to rank in a nutshell and then describe to you how we define our judgments. Um, the second part of the talk will then be about the experiments we did for the judgments and all the learnings we generated from those. So I'm going to start with learning to rank in a nutshell. And I want to start off with the motivation. So why do we want to use a model for ranking? Um, as I already said, Otto is becoming a marketplace with an increasing number of products and assortments and sellers. And the current search management contains a lot of manual work. And that is not really maintainable and scalable with a strong amount of assortments. Um, also, the current search configuration was fit to a certain context and search result groups that were manually defined. And um, with an LTMR model, we hope to be more query and result set specific and optimize on finer and especially automatically determined segments. Um, last but not least, the current ranking focuses on business relevance, implying user relevance, because if I buy something, it obviously is relevant for me. Um, but we start on the business side. And if we switch to LTR, we um, try to focus on the user relevance, implying business relevance with it, but the user comes first. Um, so how can we use a model in general for ranking products? Um, we need, first of all, the training data that contains the perfect product ordering and the features. So the training data contains of the judgments and the features for those judgments. Um, the features describe the product, they describe the query and everything we think is relevant for ranking products. Um, all this data is then fed into the LTR model. And during the training, um, the model kind of tries to find patterns in the data and understand relationships between the features and the relevance of the products. And if we have a rank, uh, learned um, model, we can use it to rank any given list of products. Um, and the identified patterns in the training data can be applied to any product and any query. Um, and then how do we do the training in concrete? Um, we have this training data you see on the slide. So we um, have a query and for each product that is returned for the query, we have a number of features that you see exemplary in the gray columns here. So um, we have features describing the query, describing the texture relevance of the product, describing matching between the query and the product and so on. Um, and the last column, the pink one is the judgment, so the perfect ordering of the products. Um, all this training data is then put into our Lambda Mart model. It is trained, and then we have a model that we can use for re-ranking. But the important question is, how do we get this gold standard perfect ordering of products? Can we calculate it? Can we 
guess it? Can we ask our customers about it? How do we know what the perfect ordering is? And um, how do we calculate it? What is relevance for the customer? And um, this is where the judgments come into play. So our, ju our judgment definition actually. How do we estimate the relevance for the customer? And a common approach in data science is doing crowdsourcing or asking expert or asking the whole team to do a data labeling day each week. Um, and then they will be shown products or rankings and asked for the relevance of those. Um, that is a good approach to cover topicality. So you know that a shoe is a shoe and that is relevant for that query. But in an e-commerce context, um, we need some more. We have to include something like trends and seasonality and personal preference even. Um, and uh, due to this trends and, and seasonality effect, also the evaluated products from, from handcrafted labeling are very quickly outdated. And those are all reasons why we decided to use the big data that we have and use implicit feedback um, from our customer logs to model our judgments. But which of the big data that we have do we use now to define the relevance? Um, I think many of you will know the customer funnel that is defined for an e-commerce journey. So many people um, visit the page, they search for something and they view a lot of products. Then they click on maybe a couple of them Maybe they even add one to their cart, and if we are lucky, they order it. But the most um, the most reliable signal for relevance if the customer then even keeps the product and is happy with it. Um, so as you see, the deeper we go in this funnel, the reliability of the signal grows. But on the other hand, if we stay higher up in the funnel, we have a much, much larger amount of data. And another... Um, Another positive side on being higher in the funnel is that the proximity to the search event grows. So we are closer to the query that was issued and we have a, a better connection between the query and the signal that was given from the user. Um, all those were reasons for us to focus on using clicks as a first approach to measure relevance. And our assumption was that if we increase the number of clicks, we it will carry through the whole funnel and increase Add to cards, orders, and happy customers as well. Um, and now in more detail, how do we calculate the judgments? Um, we calculate a click probability for each product for a given query by dividing the clicks through the number of views. But as you can see in these examples, this is very dependent on the number of data points we have um, or the number of observations we have for each data point. So a product with zero clicks and one view has a zero click probability with one click and one view has a 100% click probability. And that doesn't seem very reasonable. Um, this is why we leverage a Bayesian probability approach to generate more reliable click probabilities. Um, for this, we assume a common base click probability for all products for a given query. And with each observation we collect for the products, we move the real click probability for that product away from this mean click probability. Either it becomes higher if we observe many clicks, or if we observe less clicks, it becomes lower. Um, and last but not least, um, I think all of you are also aware of the position bias that we are also observing in our data. So independent of relevance of a product, the probability of people clicking on it if it is high up in the list is higher than if it is lower in the list. And um, to compensate for the position bias, we chose a very simple approach um, of inverse probability weighting. So we just apply a debiasing weight to each observed click probability on a position that is larger than position one. Um, now you know how we implemented our judgments and Arne will continue now with what experiments we did based on our assumptions and what we learned from them. Yeah, uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so at the beginning, we were pretty confident about our judgment and the way we calculated. So we originally wanted to get started with the learning to rank model right away and start to, to do a B test and everything. 
Um, but then we thought uh, maybe just for the sake of safety, we should, uh, it wouldn't hurt to take a little test just to ver validate that the quality of our judgments is good enough before we feed it into the model. So we uh, thought of some kind of experiment how to test the judgments. And basically we use the elevation component as a technical integration in our solar. And then we, we rank like the top 100 products of a random sample of about 5,000 queries directly by judgment score. So basically like the, the product with the highest judgment score would be number one and, and so on. So, and we figured the gold standard, that's the best ranking we have should beat our status quo easily. Uh, for the next, yeah. So before we started the AB test, we, we uh, thought about how do we define success? And we came up with three hypotheses. So we expected the, the users to, to click products on higher positions and would measure that with a shift in the click distribution towards the top positions. Then second, we expected users to click on more products, which would be like the click-through rate to measure it. And last but not least, um, the conversion rate, because we, we thought, um, of course, when there are more relevant products, people go to the detail page of these products they will eventually buy them as well. So that was like our plan. And then we come to the experiment results. And that's what happened. So first of all, our first hypothesis um, check. So we, we shifted the click distribution towards the top position, looks good. The second one is the click through rate. Um, we saw an uplift there also kind of nice, like plus 4% on the click through rate is compared to other, other, our other ranking experiments, quite a good improvement. And then to the third one, that was came as a big surprise to us because the conversion rate didn't go up. It didn't even stay the same. It went down actually minus 3% and minus 3%. That is like really a lot of money going to, we are going to lose if, if that would be life. So um, that was like the biggest surprise we had. In, in the beginning, we expected, uh, can you click one more? Yeah, so we, we expected the click-through rate to go up and we thought of like the worst case scenario would be like we bring more people to the detail page, but none of them will do any additional buy. But we never expected that it's possible to push more people into the purchasing funnel and in the end, less money coming out on the other side. So. Big surprise for us. So that's how our judgment journey started. So it was planned as like one experiment. It turned out to be a longer journey of at least three months. We are still working on it now. And we did so far like five iterations on the judgments. And uh, can you click one more? Yeah, uh, spoiler, we still didn't beat the status quo. So it's quite tricky. And today we want to talk to you about like the two major findings we had. So the first one is availability matters actually a lot. So we started to look at our data to understand what the heck was going on there. And here on the right side, you see like the top 14 positions of our list and the um, average change in, in availability per position. And as you can see, the uh, availability was worse in every single position. And um, we see like decrease between 20 and 40% for most of it. And we also know that people don't buy delayed products that much because who wants to wait for like one week when they found a product they like. So that's the basic explanation why um, the conversion rate went down. So what happened here? We pushed the, the relevant products on the top of the list as planned, but these products or many of these products were delayed at the same time. And the users didn't know that because on the search result page, we don't give the information about the availability status. So they had to click on it and on the detail page, they will find out ah, it's delayed and then they are frustrated and don't buy it. So um, they made a relevancy decision by the click with a lack of information that is relevant for them. That's the explanation why the first two metrics um, went up because they only concern this um, search result page. <clears throat> and the last metric, which is more related to the basket, uh, went down. And that actually comes uh, brings us to a very interesting topic. Um, the perceived relevance depends on the given information. And the given information changes in the different steps of the customer journey. So 
for the search result page, we give a lot of information like the picture, the name of the product, we have the customer review, we have the price and several others like the most crucial information. When the user goes to the detail page, he will get some additional information like the availability, like the, um, like the seller and the shipment cost. And then on the, on the last step of the purchasing funnel in the basket, he will get even more information about like the payment options. And um, like if he got products from different sellers in the basket, you might even find out that he will have to pay several shipment costs. And that actually changes, can change the reception of relevance for a certain product. And that is a very important thing for us because we are trying to model the relevancy and relevancy is like a multi-dimensional concept. So on the first step, the, the search result page, we actually have enough information when it comes to like topicality. So users can decide whether the product is relevant for the um, for the query. Probably enough information to decide whether it is matches their personal preferences. But there are other dimensions or aspects of relevancy. Like, is it relevant for me to buy? And information for this is like the availability. And if we don't capture this um, information in the signal of the click, then we can't model the relevancy, especially if we want to improve like the, the conversion rate, which is at the end of this funnel. Um, next one, please. So what, what, how, how do we include the availability in the judgments or learning to rank? So what we did first is, um, we filtered out all the delayed product from our judgment list. That means we will only elevate or boost um, relevant products that are available. And then we ran another test and it turns out the conversion rate looked much better than in the previous iterations. We still didn't beat the status quo, but it was a step in the right direction. So did that solve our problem with the availability and learning to rank? Definitely not because basically all we did is like filtering out relevant products from our training data that will certainly not solve the problem of availability. So we, we thought about how, how we can handle it in, in, in the end. And we came up with a couple of things we have to do. The first one is um, we have two options to strengthen the relevant signals. Like the first one is change the given information on the search result page. If we include availability, and that is crucial for the relevancy in terms of I want to buy this product, and we include it on the search result page, the user, when he clicks, will have this information and the signal strength of the click will rise. Or second option would be um, get rid of the clicks at all and then move on to add to baskets or orders as a relevant signal because um, these signals take part in a later step where the users had all these information. And actually, we are planning to proceed with the second one. So that is like one of our next iterations instead of clicks to use the add to basket and the add to, add to wish list as a relevant signal. And we, we already discussed that we probably will mix like clicks and add to basket and orders at some point. That is some stuff we want to figure out later on. But even if we include or strengthen the signal, um, that won't be enough because especially, especially the availability is a very tricky thing when it comes to, to relevance because it's highly dynamic. So at the time when we gather the signal for the training data, the availability status of a certain product might be different than to the time when we actually rank that product. For example, we can have a delayed product in the, in the time we gather the training data. So that product will gather less clicks and orders because it seems to be less relevant due to the availability. And then when we rank it and it's available, we will probably underestimate the relevancy of this product. So it's not enough just to include it in the, in the signals. And um, what we think is the right way to handle it is to connect the availability with the relevant signal. So at the moment we gather the, the signal of the click, we should also gather the availability status at that time to get the connection between the availability and the relevant signal, and then include availability as a LTR feature. We didn't test that yet. That is like one of the first steps we will do when we really start working on, on learning to rank. 
So, but at least from this experiment, we learned that that is like a very crucial topic for the whole ranking thing. And with that, we can go on to the next uh, key learning we found, and that concerns the judgment quality. So we did some query level analysis um, because we found some queries that not only have a worse had a worse conversion rate, but also a worse click through rate, and that didn't quite uh, match to the pattern we've seen with the um, availability. So we, we looked in more detail into the data and what you see here on the right side, that is basically for the query uh, guys t-shirt, the products ranked by um, judgment score. So that is basically what the first page would look like. And as you can see, there are many products with a rather good judgment score, but very little absolute clicks and views. And um, that's due to the fact that we, we just use the ratio of clicks and views to, to score. And what happened here in the end is um, we will put this products on the first page of the search result. And due to the first page, we will get more traffic on it. So these products will get more views, um, but they generated less clicks. So the ratio declined. And um, on the next day, all these products would be gone because we, we recalculated the judgment on a daily basis. So that shows that these products were not super relevant. And the other thing that happened is, um, so all these products were, were gone. And if you, if you look at it, it's like 80% of the whole list is basically affected. And on the next day, new products would come up with also that generated like one click, one view on the day before and refill these spots. So we have a like highly dynamic ranking <clears throat> and users who came back and wanted to pick up a session from a couple of days ago, probably had a very hard time to find what they're looking for because the first page looked completely different. Um, next one, please. Um, so, this is basically a question, how many interactions do we really need to generate reliable relevance judgments? And there are different options. Whoa, uh, sorry. Um, there are different options to, to solve this problem. We could work on, on the prior because the prior is basically um, built to, to solve this, this um, particular problem. But we, we thought about it and then we figured out an, another approach and we went with that one. So the, the approach we took is filtering out products with less than 100 views. So we built in some kind of threshold additional to the prior. And then we ran another experiment and it showed that um, that really gave an uplist on click-through rate and conversion rate. So the approach, the approach seems to work, at least for the judgment tests. What we still have to figure out is um, in the end this is a quality versus quantity decision so we we cut off a, a amount of our training data um, to raise the quality is it enough to train a learning to rank model or maybe did we even like uh, brought some kind of bias in the training data by filtering by applying these filters we don't know yet but um, as soon as we work on learning to rank on the models we will we will know if it turns out that this approach doesn't this approach doesn't work, we still have to tweak the filter or maybe go for the prior or think of other me methods to do it. Um, next one, please. So these were like the two key learnings and then we have like two general learnings. Um, the first one is we followed some kind of continuous test and learn approach. And this is very important for us, that's why we mentioned it. And um, because it brought us a, a very high speed in, in learning. So if you think of a build measure learn cycle, um, we really um, managed to, while one experiment was running, so we are measuring, um, we started to build the next iteration to lose less time. And once we the experiment was running for like one week, we started to analyze the data to generate more insights. Um, so we will have more experiment ideas for our experiment backlog. And by that, um, we managed to, to um, chain one experiment after the other with very little time in between. So in the end, we, we managed to do like five iter full iterations in, in three months. And the second thing is basically test your judgments because it's really worth it. Um, at the beginning, we, we didn't think it would be like a big 
big thing to do. And but in the end, we are so glad that we did it. If, if I imagine that we started with the learning to rank model directly, then we would probably sitting here now and um, do some rel like um, feature engineering or work on the model. Uh, but maybe the real problem was in the judgments. So I see two main reasons why it's very good to test your judgments. So the first one is it will enable you to do data-driven decisions about your judgments. As Andrea mentioned, the calculation of these judgments is very complicated. You have like position bias, you have the prior, you have to choose which signal to use. There are many decisions to do and it will enable you to, to validate your decisions. And the second thing is, um, you will get the ability to distinguish between the quality of your judgment and the quality of the model. And I think that is very important if you want to improve, because um, if, if you just mix it together and your your test results aren't that good, it's difficult to find the right spot um, to, to tune. Okay, that's basically the end of our talk. We have, of course, one mandatory um, slide about hiring. Um, so. We are scaling our search team at Otto constantly. Search is a very big thing at Otto. We really, really love search. So if you do love search as much as we do and you're looking for a new challenge, come to us. Your job is just one step ahead. We are working on query intent understanding, ranking, core retrieval, you name it. Go to the URL otto.de slash jobs and find out more information. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Any questions? Uh, too many questions, I think. So you guys, uh, there's a lot of questions to answer and I'm just gonna kind of pluck off the top votes and we'll work our way through them as we have time. Uh, so the top getting question is, what are the approaches taken to handle new products as they would be missing CTR or other user interaction signals? So um, since for the judgment test, we didn't really implement a solution. Our um, ideas would be that if we have the learning to rank model, that in the features, the relevant information about new kinds of products are already covered. So if we don't get a completely new assortment, that that will be something we need to still figure out. Um, but for anything similar to what we have already in the shop, we will cover it with the relevance that we have for those similar products um, that are that were in the shop and already um, collected information. Great. Um, the second highest voted question is, how, you, I think you guys touched on that a little bit, but maybe they just want to refresh her. Uh, how to handle presentation bias, meaning not so much in the positional discount that you did, but the fact that something good might have been buried and just not shown uh, to the users. How do you measure improvements in recall? So um, I think for the further ahead future, the idea would be to um, present some random new products in the top positions of the ranking or not previously seen products, so they get the prob um, so they get the ability to be clicked or to be ordered by the customers. And then, as we have seen by the example that Anna shown, um, if they are high up in the list, they collect data very quickly, and then we know. Um, if they are relevant or not. So um, this is the idea, but I think until we are there, it <laughs> takes some time. So you can join our team and help us get there actually. <laughs> yeah, that is a great, that is a great idea. Um, okay, and we're gonna keep, I, we have some time, so let's keep going. You guys are doing a great job answering them. Uh, the next question is, what is the difference between a view versus a click? Uh, how do you track views? Um, we track the views uh, in our click stream. So um, we have a tracking of the whole result page that is shown to the user. Um, and then we obviously know when the person clicked on something, but um, we, we track the whole list that is shown to somebody. And then we say, okay, um, everything above the click product was certainly seen by the user and everything below the click product we have to assume for now that um, that it wasn't seen, but we are currently implementing some tracking that we even know um, how deep the user scrolled on the page, and then we exactly know what was seen and what wasn't. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
the another question that that is really interesting is do you use the same model across all shops at auto being a large uh retail like you guys are how do you deal with situations where you have significantly less observations in a smaller shop um, um okay actually we are from like auto de is only one one shop we don't have seven one shops day. so that is uh, not a problem for us and they had a follow-up question about how do you guys deal mostly with uh languages is it mostly german is it a mix it's actually only german so it's only german. easy for us in that perspective no multi-language models yeah that is super great um okay cool uh and then the, another question in here is, is the status quo, uh, you compare experiments with based on smaller, or already with additional, sorry, let me, um, is the status quo you compare your experiments with based on smaller catalog or with all the additional sellers kind of expanding into where you guys want to go in terms of the marketplace idea? So it already contains everything we have in the shop. So that is, I, th I'm, I don't know how many other sellers we have currently, but it's uh, growing a lot in the, in the past half year at least. And I think there's already a lot of other sellers in our database. Awesome. And then the last question I have, uh, well, there's two. Uh, what to do in situations where there's no click interactions? This is a little different than the first question we asked, but this is about when, when the information need is satisfied just by looking at the search page. Um, and this might not maybe matter from the business in which y'all are trying to optimize for with your models, but I'll leave that for y'all. Yeah, so so actually we, um, we were thinking about um, one more additional possibility to measure relevance of product and that was um, interaction with the search result page and also with the with the product page which would be after a click but um, yeah even if you see that a person interacts like scrolling and filtering and looking at products for longer times um, that is something we thought could be a good relevancy signal but we haven't tested anything on um, how to implement that or if it is even measurable or if there is too much noise in the data, which could also be the case. Yeah, so that's a fair point about noise in the data. I think that's something that gets glossed over a, a lot in this game. Um, uh, some more questions came in while, while you were answering that one. So have you begun to model features relating to seasonality with your LTR models? Um, do, you, do you think this is a good fit for LTR? And I kind of piggyback on that maybe and ask about when do y'all retrain? How frequently do you retrain a model um, for your LTR product? I know we're still testing, but. Yeah, so actually we we only started to implement the very first model for testing because we are not confident with our judgments. It kind of makes no sense to build a model based on that. Um, we are planning on doing regular retraining, but I actually can't tell you how good which frequency would work or something because it would be simply guessing yeah i, I should i want to quote you on that uh, but we have no confidence in our judgments therefore it makes no sense to model uh should be oh. a big poster uh made up of that so i could like point to it um and then finally do you have one model for all product categories um, that covers everything. I know you showed product as a, as a feature in that table in one of the slides. Um, so currently we will, because it's only the beginning, we will start with one model for everything. Um, we are quite certain that it might be a good idea to split it up. Um, since we are a full stack retailer, probably furniture behaves differently than clothes. So, um, we will probably start splitting up and training different models, but we want to start very simple first and see how that goes and then learn from that.